atmosphere was weird. Uh, th there were SWAT teams about. You couldn't, you know, it was funny, I was looking across at the tote board and there was a little something different about it and I, and I looked at and there was this shed and I put up my binoculars, looked into it and there were SWAT team guys with high powered rifles. <laughs> It was very unsettling. There was a lot of security. Everybody checked coming in. It was very different uh, than a normal race day, and it was not a normal time. Uh, the Breeders' Cup was the first uh, international sporting event in New York uh, after 9-11, and it drew a lot of attention. The first glimpse I got of the crowd in the stands was before the first race, management asked us to all the jockeys to all, all walk out onto the turf course for a photo opportunity before the first race ran and we were all carrying uh, little american flags and wearing either an fdny hat or an nypd hat there was a lot of cheering for those guys carrying the american flag in that ceremony before the races began but when the horses came on the track yeah uh there were cheers there were cheers for, for uh, Tisnow in particular. He was, he was carrying the banner for us. And they're off to the cheers of the crowd and guided tour breaks alert. He broke really well. He was, I think he was number 13 or something like that. Uh, way on the outside. And at Belmont going a mile and a quarter, you're actually breaking on a turn. Um, so he got away cleanly and was able to place himself in third position. He stayed third most of the way around the track. I sort of felt that I had the two horses in front of me. I, I thought I could overtake them anytime I wanted, but I knew there was going to be some horses coming from behind, uh, most notably Saki. And so I, I heard somebody coming to my outside as, as we turned for home. I saw this big dark horse with Frankie Dottori on him coming along and I said, oh, oh here he is, uh, now that the race is on. And uh, we fought head and head from the head of the stretch to the 16th pole. And I had it in my mind that I was not going to hit him with the stick. I wanted to let him be the boss. And Saki actually went by me by about a neck. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. I might as well see if he'll respond from a little tap. So I tapped him once left-handed, and I felt him accelerate. And Tis now is battling on the American Horse of the Year and the ARC winner are heads apart with a furlong to go in the classic. On the outside, Saki, Tis now fights on. Here's the wire, desperately close. Tis now wins it for America. I knew it was going to be an exciting stretch run. Sometimes you get that feeling uh, when horses hook up at the top of the stretch. I don't really know if in my notes previous to that, uh, I was going to say that Tis now wins it for America. I don't know, but it was in my subconscious somewhere. Uh, some would argue that that was a rather jingoistic thing to say, but that was the story. That was a big story there. When he screamed, Tis now wins it for America, uh, it, was a, it was a happy day, a real happy day, especially in light of what happened just a month earlier. In the back of my mind was the story. And you gotta realize that at Belmont Park, uh, I lived right by Belmont Park. I lived uh, two blocks from the training track. And many people in my neighborhood were New York City firemen. 30 people from my church died in 9-11. Obviously at that point in time, people were trying to latch onto something positive that could happen in their lives. With, with the devastation and the tragedy of 9-11, of uh, people were really longing for something to make them happy. And uh, it just so happened that the Yankees won the World Series that year, and it really put a lot of smiles on people's faces, that, that for sure. And then when Tis Now wins it for America, uh, that was kind of the icing on the cake. So people do, from time to time, uh, go, I remember my favorite call years was Tis Now, and this race or that race, you know, and it was funny. <laughs> we were playing golf the other day and Chris McCarron's in the foursome in front of us and they're walking off the uh, tee or off the green and we're coming up 
and he yells back, and Durkin wins it for America. <laughs> The first horse that I retired under my care as stallion manager was Tisnow. Tisnow is one of the smartest horses I've ever been around. He just handles everything. It, he looks a lot. He, you know, when, I, that, when we first got him, I noticed that, that I'd take him out to graze him or something. He'd just look. Nothing fazed him. One time we had him at a tour a long time ago, and a girl got bit by a bee right next to him, and she screamed bloody murder, and he just stood there. And some of the horses that I ended up having stand as stallions, uh, Colonel John was one of my favorite, and then uh, Philly Folklore, obviously, and, and then um, Couturist, you know, he's still, he's here, and he's, he's just kind of like his dad, you know, pretty even-keeled, um, nothing much gets him wound up. I've never really seen one that didn't have composure and, and kind of knew what, what was going on and, and knew how to handle things and didn't get real excited about it. And, you know, he was a good, useful sire that was a, a California bred horse that, if you think of it, well, shouldn't have been a stallion, but he made himself by winning two Breeders' Cup Classics. And that's the other thing, really, is he's the only horse ever to win two Breeders' Cup Classics back to back. And I'm not sure if that's anybody's ever going to do that. Well, I would have to think what made Tisnow such a great racehorse was the length of his stride. It was huge. Uh, he covered a lot of ground in a hurry and he had the great ability to be able to carry that, that speed that he had. He could run all day, as, as we say, and um, he was a very, very game horse too. He had a lot of heart. He did not like to let horses go by him, and um, he, typically when he it made the front at some point in the race, he stayed there. He never let a horse get by him. He didn't lose any head-to-head -head fights. He was all heart. Tisnow's retired now. Um, he does everything the other stallions do, except he gets a little bit more lead weight because he's a teacher favorite. If he wants to stay out, we'll let him stay out a little bit longer than the other horses. He's got a little attitude to him. I think it's a little bit of a bravado as he's getting older, you know, he doesn't want anybody to mess with him. But he does squeal and, and, and does a little bit to uh, uh, try and intimidate the young boys as they go through. So it doesn't work, but he thinks it does. So we'll, we'll let him think that. Our first three stallions that we retired or, or got here were obviously Distorted Humor, Tisnow, and Spitestown. And those three were unbelievable to set the tone for Windstar. Just kind of a rock, you know, um, the reliable horse um, that helped my career out as well as Distorted Humor did. You know, uh, if it wasn't for those two horses, um, or in Spitestown, obviously, um, you know, I'd just kind of be a regular Joe. But now, you know, people say, oh, that's the guy that took care of Distorted Humor and Tisnow. So, and they were pretty easy horses to take care of, really. Don't tell anybody that. What I learned from him was tremendous. He taught me a lot about the relationship between a person and a horse. Once I learned, I tried to figure out what made him tick and just let him be the boss. That's what he wanted. So I just followed his lead and, and uh, fortunately, we had a lot, of, a lot of success together. He was certainly very, very special and I love the fact that he lives 10 minutes from me so I get to see him quite often. And so it's, it's nice. Um, yeah, he's special.